Second. Seconded. Huh? No, no, you just, you just put up your hand. Member Sibley's. Are there any matters arising from the, the minutes of the meeting? All right, if there are no matters arising, let me move straight to item number six. And could we invite in the team from the Nutrition Products Limited and the Ministry? Yes, member siblings. Hey, Jerry, might I ask for a meeting in camera at this moment? Before we start? Before we start. How would we do that? One, members, one second, please. Uh, Member Siblis has asked for an in-camera meeting before we start. I'm just putting it to the members. The members in agreement? Okay. Could I, so. All right, we're just going to go in the conference room um, next door. If ever there was a time to take care of your mental health, it is now. Now, when your physical health so clearly impacts your emotional health. Now, when we need to talk and listen to each other. Now, when supporting each other means survival. Now, in a time of COVID-19. Speak up. Speak now. Beat COVID-19. Call 888-NEW-LIFE. 639-5433. Jamaica is a beautiful place. Our people have a beautiful spirit. But we are too aggressive and the way we interact with our friends and neighbors, I genuinely believe that we have the capacity to deal with this problem of violence. But it's gonna take all of us. It's gonna take every organized group of Jamaicans that we fundamentally reject violence. Violence has no place in, in a modern society. Here is a special parenting message brought to you by the National Family Planning Board, 5 Sylvan Avenue, Kingston 5. If you want your children to improve, let them overhear the nice things you say about them to others. That was a special parenting message brought to you by the National Family Planning Board, 5 Sylvan Avenue, Kingston 5. Hello Jamaica, I'm Dion Jacks Miller. It's unbelievable to me whenever I buck up somebody who is still asking if COVID-19 is real. Because my doctor died of COVID-19. I had COVID recently and it was a severe case. Most of my lungs were affected. I am so grateful to be alive. Take COVID seriously, guys. Some people won't be affected, that's true, but others may have long-term effects and some people will die. Let's do all we can to protect ourselves and to protect others. A message endorsed by the Ministry of Health and Wellness. This is our home, Jamaica. And tourism is the lifeblood of our country. Let's all feel good again. Whether with family or friends, we want you to enjoy your staycation. We have to ensure that they are comfortable, they feel well protected. New standards are in place to ensure your safety. We are here to serve you better, so you can have the best experience. Come out and rediscover Jamaica. We are ready. We are ready. We are ready. Rediscover Jamaica. Heartbeat of the world. The 
following is brought to you by the Office of the Prime Minister. The best indicator of Jamaica's capacity in managing the health system would be the number of beds that we have. And we have to be very careful about how we as a country loosen our measures because very rapidly this virus could spread and the number of beds that we have could easily be used up. That would throw us into a crisis. It was not so long ago in February that we approached that crisis level. We do not want to get there again. The proceeding was brought to you by the Office of the Prime Minister. Hello everyone, my name is Abigail Whittingham and I am so excited for this genesis of our 100 Days of Prayer devotional series. Without a doubt, as we meet with God every day, something miraculous will happen, relationships will be restored, healing will be given, and hearts will be mended. For this, the first day of our 100 day journey, I want you to join with me for the next few minutes as we reflect on God's words and leverage the power of prayer. Are you ready? Let's go. There's this song that I used to hear when I was growing up as a little girl in the church. The words of the song say, is your burden heavy as you bear it all alone? Does the road you travel harbor dangers yet unknown? Are you growing weary in the struggle of it all? Jesus will help you with all his name you call. Truth is, I never fully understood the weight of this song until I got older and started to experience some really heavy situations. Yes, it's true. Sometimes I am so engulfed in the stress of life that I feel as if I am bearing it all alone. One Sabbath, I listened to a very interesting sermon and the pastor told the story of a church member who was on the brink of ending her life. She lost all hope. This woman who had given up was a long-standing member of the pastor's church. I don't know the woman personally, but I can just imagine that she was probably the deaconess that sanitized you or took your temperature at the door every Sabbath morning. She was probably the woman on the church choir with that strong altar note. She could have been a prayer warrior who petitioned the throne room of grace when you needed it the most. The truth is there are people in our church who are carrying some gargantuan burdens on a daily basis. And who knows, you watching this very video right now, you might be that individual. But I'm so happy that I know somebody who is a burden bearer. I know somebody who is a deliverer, who is a restorer, who is the mighty rock on which I stand even when the storms of life may come my way. Matthew 11 verse 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Notice, the text starts with the word come, which means that this is your invitation to come to the Father so that you can bask in peace and rest. Today, our prayers will be focused on a few things. Number one, we'll be praying that God's church will stand firm in the midst of this health crisis. And number two, we'll be praying for the regional evangelistic campaigns that are currently taking place. So that includes the members of the Inter-American Division and the candidates for baptism. And lastly, we'll be praying that we will all take this invitation and find rest and peace in Jesus Christ. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this short message, Lord. For the individuals who are currently watching this video, Lord, you know them by name, by nature. Even before they were conceived, you know who these individuals are. 
Lord, we come here and we, we listen and we minister and we sit in church, but we are so bombarded by the burdens and the stress of life sometimes. It takes us by surprise. Sometimes some people don't even know what we go through, but Lord, we pray that you will indeed be that mighty rock, that restorer, that redeemer, that will help us to, to, to relieve us of our stress. Lord, we pray for that a woman that a man who feels as if he or she wants to give up lord i pray that you will help them know that there is hope in you lord for all the evangelistic campaigns that are currently taking place all across the world into american division too lord i pray that souls will indeed be one and people will be drawn to you in your name we pray amen Thank you so much for tuning in to day one of our 100 days of prayer devotional series. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And you know what to do. Follow us on all our social media platforms at Sure to the SDA Church. My name is Abigail Whittingham. Stay blessed and I'll see you in the next one where we will discuss submitting to God. Bye. COVID has stressed me. Do take the vaccine. And through it all, our healthcare workers have been the real MVPs tackling COVID-19. Caring for you is our priority. As frontliners in the pandemic, they got vaccinated. I got the vax. I had to protect myself so that I can protect you. No, sir? Me. Stop for it because my vax up. I made sure my mom and I got the vaccine. Protection is key. Me, vax up, me stop for it. Fam, help us protect you, your family and friends. So should you. Enough now. Take the vaccine. Get vaccinated. Get back to life. Here is a special parenting message brought to you by the National Family Planning Board. 5 Sylvan Avenue, Kingston 5. There's no job more important than parenting. That was a special parenting message brought to you by the National Family Planning Board, 5 Sylvan Avenue, Kingston 5. The following is brought to you by the Office of the Prime Minister. When your turn comes for the vaccine, please take the vaccine. It is absolutely important for those who have hesitancy and fear and all of that is legitimate it's healthy but i believe we have seen the vaccine at work we know what the risks are there are no risk less activities in life we urge you to participate in the national program and get vaccinated the proceeding was brought to you by the office of the prime minister <laughs> A major area in high school for me was IT and EDPM. I did that for two years and from then I realized that there was a drive for more of technology. So I decided to take this step. Mr. Jones. And your colleagues, how will they look at an abuser? When the law comes knocking, you'll have nowhere to run. Mr. Brown, you're under arrest. Please get up, hands behind your head, and interlock your fingers. Turn your back on abusers. Report gender-based violence to the police. There's no excuse for abuse. Call the Bureau of Gender Affairs at 876-754-8577.
The following is brought to you by the Office of the Prime Minister. I'm saying to every single Jamaica, you will decide how this pandemic ends. If you wear your mask, if you maintain the physical distance, and if you decide to take the vaccines when it is your time, the pandemic will end. But if in frustration or just ignorance, we do not take responsibility, then the pandemic could end badly, including the loss. Of more lives. The proceeding was brought to you by the Office of the Prime Minister. Brutality isn't a legality. There's no rationality as to why this abnormality should become a mentality. A mentality which kills and torture. Are you really telling me you're afraid to speak out because you might be called an informer? Let us break the barrier of brutality and enforce it with alacrity. If you know someone who has been V, victimized, I charge you to I, interrupt their situations before their O, oppressor continues to L, lurk in their lives. Let us E, extend our hands to our brothers and sisters who are being victimized and N, never see violent acts and ignore them. Let us see, come together and be the E example so we may end a barrier on brutality. COVID-19 is still here. Always wear your mask correctly while in public places, covering your nose and mouth at all times. Masks should never be worn over the head, under your chin, below your nose, or hanging from your ears. Recovery from COVID-19 can take up to 60 days or more. The mask or the ventilator, you choose. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Watch, watch yourself online, that's what my crew say. Make it a new day. A reminder by the Broadcasting Commission. We the BCJ. What if, what if it was your friend in the mix? What if, what if it was your sis in the pit? What if, what if you want a terrorist watch list? What if, what if that I'm what are you do? Don't like, don't comment, don't click. Uh -uh. Report it, block it, don't make it stick. Don't. Don't trust everybody on the internet. Use it to step up your intellect. Oh. So online you have to be safe too. Don't believe the rumors or the fake news. Don't go everywhere to try to take Watch you. Yourself. Protect the kids or they find a way what to. If, what if it was your friend in the mix? What if, what if it was your sis in the pit? What if, what if you want a terrorist watch list? What if, what if suppose that that one? What if? Wait up, please. The following is brought to you by the Office of the Prime Minister. When your turn comes for the vaccine, please take the vaccine. It is absolutely important for those who have hesitancy and fear and all of that is legitimate. It's healthy. But I believe we have seen the vaccine at work. We know what the risks are. There are no riskless activities in life. We urge you to participate in the national program and get vaccinated. The proceeding was brought to you by the Office of the Prime Minister. Prime is Jamaica's number one threat. As we stay apart while working together to fight COVID-19, we must all live good and unite against crime and violence in Jamaica. Live good means talk it out, don't fight it out. We must live good to build a safe Jamaica. Stay home, stay safe, live good. Jamaica and its workforce are advancing quickly. Life-changing opportunities are arising. You need training and support. We are the Renewed Heart NSTA Trust, committed to providing new and emerging skills training and opportunities. Come to Heart. We'll help you claim your place in the workforce of the future. If 
ever there was a time to take care of your mental health, it is now. Now, when your physical health so clearly impacts your emotional health. No, when we need to talk and listen to each other. Now, when supporting each other means survival. No, in a time of COVID-19. Speak up, speak now. Beat COVID-19. Call 888-NEW-LIFE. 639-5433 Jamaica, home of the resilient, passionate and hardworking. A people and a nation who have achieved and defied all odds. Working to keep their economy growing their country thriving from investments made in innovative opportunities and exports demanded globally. We have a vision now within our grasp where Jamaica becomes the place of choice to live, work, raise families and do business. We will not let go of this vision. We will grow. We will overcome these challenging times and look to the future with hope and positivity. These are special times. The world as we know it has changed, but home will always be in our hearts. And in Jamaica, you can always find a home. Think you know Jamaica? Look again. You will be surprised. What if they knew that you abused her? Her family? Mr. Jones. Your colleagues, how will they look at an abuser? When the law comes knocking, you'll have nowhere to run. The brown, you're under arrest. Please get up, hands behind your head, and interlock your fingers. Turn your back on abusers. Report gender based violence to the police. There's no excuse for abuse. Call the Bureau of Gender Affairs at 876-754-8577. Brutality isn't a legality. There's no rationality as to why this abnormality should become a mentality. A mentality which kills and torture. Are you really telling me you're afraid to speak up because you might be called an informer? Let us break the barrier of brutality and enforce it with alacrity. If you know someone who has been V, victimized, I charge you to I, interrupt their situations before their O, oppressor continues to L, lurk in their lives. Let us E, extend our hands to our brothers and sisters who are being victimized and N, never see violent acts and ignore them. Let us C, come together and be the E, example, so we may end a barrier on brutality. Jamaica and its workforce are advancing quickly. Life-changing opportunities are arising. You need training and support. We are the Renewed Heart NSTA Trust, committed to providing new and emerging skills training and opportunities. Come to Heart. We'll help you claim your place in the workforce of the future. Crime is Jamaica's number one threat. As we stay apart while working together to fight COVID-19, we must all live good and unite against crime and violence in Jamaica. Live good means talk it out, don't fight it out. We must live good to build a safe Jamaica. Stay home, stay safe, live good. Jamaica. 
reduce your risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it. Avoid close contact with anyone with the cold or flu-like symptoms. If you think you've been exposed to COVID-19, stay home, self-isolate immediately and call 888-1LOVE. That's 888-663-5683. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. We work to make communities safer by essentially looking at the structures in the community that contribute greatest to social capital building. Try to reinforce, build, and establish those structures in a way that the community can sustain their own safety and own their own peace. When we say, for instance, we're doing a zinc fence removal program, what we're really doing is improving the line of sight. If you're on the street and you can see better what is behind the fences, then as you, as you walk along the street or children play and etc., you're able to contribute to crime prevention. We believe in terms of our mandate and our responsibility that by making communities safer, we can make Jamaica safer. What if they knew that you abused her? Her family? Mr. Jones. At your colleagues, how will they look at an abuser? When the law comes knocking, you'll have nowhere to run. Mr. Brown, you're under arrest. Please get up, hands behind your head, and interlock your fingers. Turn your back on abusers. Report gender-based violence to the police. There's no excuse for abuse. Call the Bureau of Gender Affairs at 876-754-8577. The following is brought to you by the Office of the Prime Minister. I'm saying to every single Jamaica, you will decide how this pandemic ends. If you wear your mask, if you maintain the physical distance, and if you decide to take the vaccines when it is your time, the pandemic will end. But if in frustration or just ignorance, we do not take responsibility, then the pandemic could end badly including the loss of more lives. The proceeding was brought to you by the Office of the Prime Minister. Brutality isn't a legality. There's no rationality as to why this abnormality should become a mentality. A mentality which kills and torture are you really telling me you're afraid to speak up because you might be called an informer? Let us break the barrier of brutality and enforce it with alacrity. If you know someone who has been V, victimized, I charge you to I, interrupt their situations before their O, oppressor continues to L, lurk in their lives. Let us E, extend our hands to our brothers and sisters who are being victimized and N, never see violent acts and ignore them. Let us see, come together and be the E example so we may end a barrier on brutality. Here is a special parenting message brought to you by the National Family Planning Board, 5 Sylvan Avenue, Kingston 5. The way we treat our children directly impacts what they believe about themselves. That was a special parenting message brought to you by the National Family Planning Board, 5 Sylvan Avenue, Kingston 5. Jamaica, home of the resilient, passionate and hardworking. A people and a nation who have achieved and defied all odds. Working to keep their economy growing, their country thriving, from investments made in innovative opportunities and exports demanded globally. We have a vision, 
now within our grasp, where Jamaica becomes the place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business. We will not let go of this vision. We will grow. We will overcome these challenging times and look to the future with hope and positivity. These are special times. The world as we know it has changed, but home will always be in our hearts. And in Jamaica... Permanent Secretary, and could I ask you to introduce the team from the Ministry of Education and New Produ Nutrition Products Limited. Sorry, one second. Are there any apologies for absence? I forgot to tell you that. No apologies? Okay. Go ahead, Madam Pierce. Might not work in? Just check the mic. Second. Oh. Okay. And I say, come down. <laughs> <laughs> it on. Okay, good morning, Chairman and members of the committee and members of the Auditor General's team. With me this morning, I have Mr. Narayan from the NPL, CEO, Dr. Kassan Troop, who is our CEO at the Ministry of Education and Youth, Mrs. Sonia Banton, our Principal Finance Officer, and Mr. Mr. Lincoln Johnson, our post audit director, Mrs. Audrey Gentles McCollum, who is our chief internal auditor, and two other members. Could you introduce yourselves, please, from the NPL? Or do you want to say who they are? Good morning, members, and everyone present. The members from NPL are Antoinette Bowman. She's the financial accountant. Mr. Michael Montgomery, he's our warehouse and distribution manager. And Ms. Winsome Blackwood, who is our HR officer. Thank you. All right, thank you. Madam Auditor General, could you introduce your team? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. With me this morning in person is Gay Lulim. Deputy Auditor General, Ricardo Hall, Audit Principal, Junior Thomas, Director of Audit, Kalisha Salmon, Director of Audit, Camilla Whitby, Director of Audit, Rochelle Bailey Thomas, Senior Auditor, and Kevin Wright, Auditor. Online, joining us by Zoom, we have Jennifer Hutchinson, Senior Auditor, Alicia Powell, Director, and Daniel Archer, Auditor. Thank you. Ms. Blake from the Ministry of Finance. I don't know if we're hearing it. Is your mic working? Yeah? Okay, all right, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. And I'm picking up online uh, members Charles and uh, member Chin, who have joined us remotely. Madam AG, I just ask you to just provide an overview of the audit, and then Madam PSL just ask you to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The audit was commissioned based on complaints received by way of our website in, I believe, June of 2019, as well as the audit report, the findings of the audit report emanating from the audit that was conducted in 2012. The report cited um, failings um, with respect to the governance um, arrangements at NPL, but I want to note 
that the report also indicated, Mr. Chairman, that the audit identified significant improvement in the number of tests conducted to determine the nutritional content of the meals produced and distributed to the schools. This was an adverse finding in our 2012 report. What remained outstanding for us is um, the lack of evidence that any analysis of the findings of that assessment, which would have been undertaken by the BSJ, was done. And I think we made it in our report, we would have indicated that we, we would have expected that there would have been some comparison to standards, national standards, or otherwise if national standards are not available. The report also outlines, uh, Mr. Chairman, it is contained in the problem, provided the operational inefficiency which we in which we, in our opinion, um, existed, as well as our concerns around certain procurement practices and, um, to a lesser extent, um, human resource uh, management issues. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, AG. Mrs. Dyer? Thank you, Chair. So when I assumed office in late October, I found the report of the Auditor General in place and the recommendations were there. Having read the report, I concurred with the findings as presented in the report and the need for improvements in the operational efficiencies of the NPL as well as uh, for the decision to be made as to the strategic direction that the NPL would take. And so I have with me today, Mr. Narayan and the team from NPL, who since coming to office, I've asked them to report to me on what steps were taken to ensure that the recommendations contained in the report of the Auditor General were responded to or are being responded to in, in an urgent manner as stated by the report. So, we're here today to respond to how far we've reached in terms of implementing those recommendations. Okay, thank you, Madam Pierce. I'll, I'll start by asking, what is the current decision on the future of NPL? Um, the report outlines where there have been um, differing views on the strategic direction. So if you could give us an update from the ministry's perspective as to what, where is NPL going? Okay, so briefly I noted the shifts in the strategic, strategic directions of the NPL as outlined in the report. But I can report to the House that a meeting was held with the DBJ team to look into the divestment of NPL we have taken positive steps towards that. In fact, the team has been engaged and will conduct, begin to conduct their work almost immediately based on the response I got from them. We accepted the proposal that they put to us and uh, they are about to commence their work so that they can advise us on the best way forward for the entity. Is there a projected time frame in terms of uh, when you expect to hear back from DBJ, et cetera? I'm not able to say that today, Chairman, based on when we last made contact with the team. Oh, hold on, All hold right, on. Member Sibley's oh, and then Chair, Member... Chair, before Member Sibley's, I just wanted to be clear which team. When it was said the team has, uh, has started, is, is there a divestment team in place? Yes. From DBJ? Yes. Yes. Member Sibley's? Following upon that question, Chair, to the PS, um, with regards to that matter, and in fact the report, was the report given to the, the minister? Was the report um, given to the minister? The Honorable Minister of Education? Yes. And by whom? Well, I am not sure, as I'm sitting here, we, the meeting was jointly between the minister, myself, 
and the team from DBJ. Uh, recall I said at the beginning that I walked into the post at the end of October. It was already in the minister's possession. Yeah, right. And the, to follow up on that question, further follow up on, on, on that question, um, and the chairman had, had asked when the, the, there's a set date, you, you, and you had answered there is, you're not aware or you're not sure of the date, that, well, that was it? Not at this time. Thank Chair you. Chairman, in addition, um, coming out of Chairman's question, um, P.S., it would be good to send back to the committee an indication as to what is the divestment timetable. Um, you indicated just generally that concerns were raised, and Chairman said as much, in terms of the shift in strategic direction. You are now indicating very clearly that the direction is one of absolutely divestment. However, if we could get a timetable for divestment, that would be appreciated and submit to the committee, please. Yes, member, I'll do that. Okay. Yeah. Members, all right, let me, let me ask. In, in relation to, and I'm looking at the finding where Contracts totaling approximately 143 million were awarded to members of the board. Can you indicate the nature of the procurement process for those contracts, whether those contracts were subjected to competitive bidding, whether direct contracting or selective tendering? I'll hand over to Mr. Narayan. Thank you, Piers. Um, Chairman, to respond to that question, um, there was the, to, the collective contract award that you quoted, um, several contracts and it was different methodologies that was used. Um, the national competitive bidding process was used um, for, for specific contracts and direct contracting was also used. Can you be more specific for me? So for example, of the 143, could you indicate how much of it was subjected to competitive bidding, how much was direct contracting? Do you have that information? Not, not, it, not in its entirety, Chairman. Um, what do you have that you could provide to the House now, to the committee? Okay, Chairman, to respond to that question, as outlined in the report, um, the contract for sanitation, janitorial services, the total amount for that contract was $7.4 million. And it was procured how? What was the methodology? Limited, the process of limited tender was used, Chairman. And in a second instance, um, the national competitive bidding process was also used for this country. Mr. Narayan, I know you don't have the information at your fingertips. Could I ask 
that you sent to the committee, just a breakdown of for the 143 of the methodology used for the procurement of those services. Member Holness and chairman. Member Sibles. Oh, sorry. Sorry, one second, Member. Member Guy, all right, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead Member Holness. The Auditor General raised concerns in terms of doing cost-benefit analysis for meal preparations. I just want us to have a clear understanding of where we are now. How much of snacks and um, are prepared for distribution to schools, whether or not you are still running the other facilities outside of Kingston, just to give us an idea of what are we doing now at NPL, how many facilities are we running, and how much are we providing? Is it everything in terms of snacks to schools without canteens? Is it partially to schools that do have canteens? And if you could still give some sort of response to the Auditor General, because I notice it's still unresolved, as to justifying that the way you're functioning at this level is efficient, even if you do not have the data to do a cost-benefit analysis. Thank you for the question, member. <laughs> could, could everybody who is online mute, please? Or if we could mute everybody? Thank you. Go ahead, um, Mr. Nair. Currently, the operations at NPL has ceased um, since the onset of COVID. Um, so there's no, there has been no distribution um, since COVID. Well, limited distribution, I should say, when the pandemic started. But currently, there's no operational activities being engaged at NPL. Um, as it relates to the cost-benefit analysis um, for of the meals, we have been looking at, at the cost to produce and the cost to purchase finished products. So we have been um, conducting these analyses for in anticipation for the resumption of operations. So follow, following up to that. We are going back to face-to-face. -face. Students will be going back to school. Some persons have started off two, three days per week. Other schools have actually gone back to full classes. Would you be able to say at what point you think you will resume production? And if production will be resumed in a way that it conforms to the Auditor General's statement of being very clear that you are the most efficient cost-wise are most cost effective in providing your service to the schools. Thank you for the question, Member. As advised by the PS, um, operations will resume in April of this year. Could I, I just have a follow up question. In the, since your seized operations due to COVID, you would still be carrying costs of staff and some other costs. Do you have an idea of what your annual running costs have been since you have ceased production? Just, thank you for the question, Chairman. And while, while I wait the answer, I have a slightly tangential question. In the food items that you procure on behalf of the students, um, what percentage of that could be considered local content, whether it be juices, fruits, other um, food that would come from local agricultural production versus stuff that we would import? Thanks again for the question, Chairman. The cost to operate is approximately 600 million. The current 600 cost, million the current cost. with no production? Salaries, that includes salaries and the fixed overheads that we incur. Wow, 600 million. That's correct, okay. Chairman. That's a pretty large budget. Per, per annum, right? Per annum. Per annum. Okay. The salaries is approximately 327 million. What's your staff complement right now? 
Currently, we have a staff complement of 231. Okay. So, in the, what, what have those persons been doing in the period where there has been no production? Um, Chairman, it would be good to figure out in terms of the staff complement, um, the volume of individuals who are in the structure for production activities, right. administrative. Well, that's why I asked him what, what those persons would have been doing. If you could give us a breakdown of how many are production versus administrative and in the, in the period, how have those staff members been engaged? And Chairman, while they are coming up with the information just for the public, because they may want the government policies really not to lay off individuals. So during the COVID period, um, no, just for, no, Chairman isn't questioning it. I'm just saying as a general statement for the public to, to understand, if it were a private sector, many individuals would have selected the option to save money to lay off a substantial amount of staff or put them on various mechanisms of reduced pay. But just so the public understands and appreciates that we are not questioning the retention of the employees because we know government policy is not to lay off anybody. But just having an appreciation, as Chairman asks, what would the production staff um, be doing to make some sort of gainful contribution to the society in the duration? I'm awaiting information from the HR personnel okay, chairman. Okay. Um, there was another point raised by the AG in respect of the mechanism used for recruitment and selection that you were not following the process of the Ministry of Finance. And I did see the explanation about, you know, high attrition rate and quickly needing to... Um, get persons back on board with one-year contracts. Are you currently in the process of doing any form of hiring at this stage? Are you in a position that you have um, any of the establishment which will require refilling between now and April? Thank you for the question, member. We actually are in the process of engaging um, em or recruiting we have advertised all vacant positions in anticipation of the resumption of operations. And we have recently recruited a HR manager and in compliance with the Auditor General findings, she did not, the, 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 the person that was recruited was not accepting what was being offered. And we wrote to the Ministry of Finance requesting to compensate this individual at a certain level and it, approval was granted. Um, I'm not sure if anybody can answer this question, but I'll ask nonetheless. In preparing for potential divestment, I know as a government entity, I'm not so sure if we're very concerned about what sort of funds we are able to fetch, how profitable the institution looks upon divestment. But I'm just wondering, is there any internal approach from both MOE and as well as NPL in, in terms of structuring your operation and getting yourself to uh, a level of efficiency that looks extremely attractive to any potential individual um, taking over the MPL upon divestment? Everything is done in preparation for divestment. PS can probably give me an idea. Um, mem member, uh, the enterprise team that has been formulated, we would await the report um, from that team in terms of the direction that we need to go as it relates to the divestment and formulating strategies. Or the, Madam Auditor General, you have an intervention. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just want to take up on a point made by Member Holness with respect to the policy of the government to retain 
um, employees. It's, it's not the policy to lay off workers. So I want to make it abundantly clear that that's not what our concern is about. It's not about the persons who were, who were retained. No, no, I'm not saying that, that that's what you are alluding to. So I just, I just want to clarify what the real issue is, just uh, briefly. A decision was taken. There are three, three production sites, Kingston, Westmoreland, and St. Mary. A decision was taken to cease operation at the Westmoreland site and at St. Mary temporarily, because I think um, St. Mary came back up after. There was also a decision to reduce the units produced because of um, supplying, a decision was taken to supply less school. Right, and that was before COVID, so our concern is before COVID. What concerned us is the lack of analysis, evidence of analysis. So whilst the units were reduced and the um, production sites were closed, one um, temporarily, the cost remained the same. And what we saw was an exponential increase in transportation. So things were produced in Kingston or even in St. Mary, brought to Kingston and taken back out to the east or taken back to the west. And no, I'm not suggesting that there is not um, uh, some practical reason for that, but there is just no evidence. So we saw the costs remained the same, and hence why uh, Mr. N um, Narin, I hope Narin. I get the pronounce, right, would speak to the 600 million, because even though they reduce the unit, the cost is the same to run the machines. Yes, so I, it's not about laying persons off. And yes, that's exactly what the report says, so if, I'll, I'll read it if, if there is some misunderstanding as to what we're getting at. Uh, um, um, we're not at odds, um, Madam AG. Um, since they were searching for information, I decided to take the opportunity to just have the public appreciate that, um, as would happen sometimes in the private sector, you are at liberty to make those changes with staff reduction in particular, because it is a saving mechanism. I would do it as an individual, but just so persons know, because not everybody know how government works, so it was just information for the public, not actually raising a concern in respect of their operations. And just generally as well, um, I didn't see quite any response, particularly as it relates to transportation, but I also appreciated that when you're running machines, if you're producing 600 or you produce one, there are some costs that you are not able to remove because you have scaled down from 600 to one because the machine has economies of scales that you would have had if you were producing 6,000 if it can do it. So, so I get that it would not be as an efficient operation, but the point is taken that the explanation and justification should be documented so that anybody can pick it up and say, okay, this is what is behind how we operated. I note as well, very well, that most of the Auditor General's comments have been addressed or are ongoing, so continuing to be under watch. So I actually selected for discussion items that were still in abeyance, outstanding, just to make sure that you were at a place where the recommendations from Madam AG are going to be implemented once you ramp up operations again. So, so that's where we took it from, because I, I do note that the majority of the concerns have been addressed. Member Guide and Member Siblis. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a few questions I want to ask, but the first thing I'd like to ask is, um, in terms of management response per PS, who authored the responses? Authored. Is the question directed to me? Yes, PS. Could you, could you just? I'm saying in terms of the management's response, which came in the prompt here, who authored the response? 
ministry or um, NPL or NPL or both? The team at NPL would be um, the forerunners or the four people at the forefront mm -hmm. because the information resides on the ground and they have a board that they respond to. And the ministry has, has no Subse input in it? Subsequently, mm -hmm. I called them to a meeting mm -hmm. and discussed mm -hmm. those um, So it responses. had the imprimatur of the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information then? Not, not in a direct way, as the information would reside within the entity. But you are the, you are the, the accounting officer. I am the accounting now, officer. I, I just want, this is, is, is a trite point, but one that needs to be made nonetheless. Yes. Um, is the Ministry of Education? It's the Ministry of Education. Education. Just, I have a lot of questions, but this one grabbed me as somebody who would like to see grammatic grammar being displayed. In the complement that you refer to, is spelt L I instead of L E. Oh dear. Okay. All right. No, no, no. From the Ministry of Education, it's important As a because teacher, it sends a message, yes, right, for others who would want to read it out there. Absolutely. But my question, substantive question, refers first one, the caloric value of six of of one third of the daily requirement. Um, the 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 answer by the Ministry, sorry, management's response, and by extension, the Ministry, is that. The, in most instances, the NPL was within range of required one-third daily caloric requirement as outlined by the Ministry of Health and Wellness. It is one-third, certainly. But one-third of the caloric requirement could be one-third of the sugars totally, as opposed to sugars from carbohydrate, which would give you that one-third of the daily caloric requirement. And we saw in many instances where NPL was producing mainly sugary stuff for children. And um, the, the, the mere fact that NPL um, responds to it, that yes, we were following that one-third um, caloric requirement, is, is really um, not a proper answer, first of all. Yes, you are, but um, you have also to be guided by um, the general requirement in terms of diet. And I find a little um, concerning that the NPL did not have someone on board, irrespective of the guidelines from the ministry, but a dietitian who would give some advice as to what would be the proper diet for young children going through school. Secondly, I am a little perplexed that the, the NPL's response to um, with AG's little survey, and I'm looking at the first issue number one, slide seven, in the response, that the, it would indicate that 73% of the respondents were not against NPL solution as compared to 27 that were dissatisfied. And certainly in, in terms of the whole, um, data, it supports that. But what of the 200 plus who did not respond to it? And you know, it, 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 would, be, it would be a little more appetizing for us reading it if, if NPL had indicated that, of course, we would want to see what the other 200 plus had to say. But to use that particular one as the basis for saying that okay, we satisfied a particular demand and we were 73% satisfied, I think is a little um, um, wrong. Um, and um, I want to go a bit further. The, I'm a little concerned, um, P.S., that the, the final, the final um, comment on issue three, it's not the final, but on three one. three one. That management's response was that moving forward at board meetings 
an agenda item will be for members to disclose interest in connection to or association with business providing goods and service to NPL. You know, that's mind-boggling, because I would think that any director who has been appointed to any government board ought to know that even before they accept that appointment. I understand that going forward that has to be part of the remit, and, and, the, and, and the, the management has said that that part of the agenda item of a board meeting. But I find it a little um, disturbing, deeply disturbing too, that that has to be part of what is the going forward. Yes, a, a wrong might have been committed and uh, something is being put in place. But the, the, the response to it is, to me, quite puerile, you know, quite frankly. All right. Um, could you respond to those first before I go to the other ones? Okay. Um, thank you, Member. I'm going to hand over to Mr. Narayan, who should uh, be more off with the quality of the food as well as the survey results. And then I'll try to speak to the third question. Chair, sure, before that you Mr. Narayan starts responding to that question, included in uh, Member Guy's question about um, having a dietitian or a nutritionist, would you give us an idea as well as to what does NPL supply for school children? Because the rest of the public would know exactly what it is that is your standard um, meal provision per day. And just before, Chair, because this, there's a concern that I have with regards to this percentage that, are, that is being used. I note, Chair, that there were approximately 400, the sample size, I don't even know if it's a sample size or if it's a population. 400, but I know that the Auditor General Department sent out 405 um, survey to the schools, to 405 schools. I know approximately 194, 200, between 194 to 200 and something responded. My concern is that to, to give a better picture with member Guy um, alluded to in terms of 73%. I am, I am thinking, Chair, that the percentage should be of the sample size or the population that was sent out and not of the response, the responses. And it would give a, a much more accurate picture based on the question that member guy asked in terms of we, we are not responding to the, the sample. What we are doing is responding to, to say that 205 responded and of the, of the 205 that responded X percentage. And the public is not aware that it was 405 um, survey that was sent out to the school. So in essence, the denominator should be 405 and not 200, so that we could give a better perspective to see of the 400 schools that were surveyed, 50% um, responded. And of the total 400 that were sent, we, we received 30% saying that they are satisfied, while another 15% is not satisfied. And we have no idea of another 50% because they didn't respond. Thank you. To right, so answer the member's question, First, member wholeness, as to the NPL currently 
or when we were operating, we operated two programs, a breakfast program and a snack program, snack lunch program, right? So the serving, the, the offerings under the breakfast program was an instant porridge, which consisted of a creamy wheat or a cornmeal, right? And a baked product that included a cheese bread or a spice bun. Additionally, with that serving, we also offered an eight ounce bottle of spring water. And so that was the offering under the breakfast program. For the traditional snack program, we provided a baked product along with a fruit juice with no added sugar and spring water. Right. So Is it, it was spring water or bottled water? Spring water. I asked deliberately, Chairman. Because spring water is different from bottled water. The, 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 there are two types of bottled water. One is from the spring and the other is purified. It's, it's spring, it's it's spring purified water. water. It's, it's spring water. So it's spring water, it's spring not, water purified. not purified. Not purified. So th that, that is the gamut of, of meals. That, the the spice it. bun compared to the cheese bread. Um, do you provide spice bun because spice bun is an alternative for persons who have, um, what's that? Have issues having milk and cheese, what's that called? Lactose intolerant individuals. I'm just wondering if it's a small alternative way because cheese is protein. So I am wondering if that is what you provide mostly and then for those children who are lactose intolerant, they would then get the spice bun, which is very sugary. That's, that's correct, uh, member. But we also offer the spice bun as an, a variety, to include it as a variety also. But we focus mainly on the cheese bread as, as the offering, right? But in addition to that, I um, remember... What about milk? I didn't hear milk mentioned at all. And I remember days gone by, we used to get Nutribun and milk. The, and, and the milk would have been also uh, an, added, an added, you know, item of great nutrition. And maybe for those lactose intolerant, we could do almond milk or soy. So what about milk? Um, remember, the, the cost of... The milk at the time that eroded the budget, so we had to seek alternatives to provide to the children. Question, Chair. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yes. Yes. Um, yes I, I just. Yes, that um, I'm one oh, of the on students. Moment. Hold on a moment, member. Before we we move on to. If there's oh, go on, go with nutrition. Right, so I'm still following up on um, the member's question about um, the nutritional value, and I've seen where the AG actually commended you on significant improvement in the number of tests done. However, um, she's saying that despite doing all these tests, we are still unable to meet the minimum requirement um, from NPL standpoint. So the question I have for you is what have been done or what NPL has done over the past few months to bring up the nutritional standard from what the Ministry of the Ministry of Health and Wellness has put out in their guidelines um, in comparative to what NPL has been producing. So I want to know what has been done in the past few months to, to meet those minimum requirements. All right, thank you, member, for the question. We have actively been undertaking research and development at NPL to reformulate our products and also to add additional products to, the, to our offerings. So we have been looking at introducing protein bars, a fruit cup, and we have 
been looking at adding um, cheese to our baked products. So we have actively been conducting research and development, and those are the activities that the production staff have also been involved with to answer earlier questions that was posed. Right? So they would come in to do runs from time to time to see what the results of those products are. Right. And a follow-up to that, Chair. Um, would those research feature any collaboration with the Ministry of Agriculture, SRC, um, in looking at local um, production? Like our mangoes, for example. Um, we often see a lot of our mangoes being going to waste, um, and that could also be turned into puree, and that's, that's pure organic Jamaican mangoes. Um, that is just an example off the top of my head, but is there any collaboration with the Ministry of Agriculture and SRC? In the past, remember, we have collaborated with the, mini the Ministry of Agriculture. Talks are ongoing to introduce um, several proposals that were put forward. Um, those fell through, but we are actively working with the Scientific Research Council um, on these new initiatives that we're undertaking. Can you, can you, one second, can you say why those fell through? I had asked a question before about the percentage of what is local content, and I asked it specifically because we, we are spending a lot of money as taxpayers to keep the entity open, and we want to support local farmers and local production. So I don't know what the experience was in the past, read the Ministry of Agriculture, but maybe you could tell us why those efforts at collaboration didn't materialize. Um, Chairman, what I can say is that there were meetings based on proposals that NPL had put forward. Um, they, there was just no continuation. Um, there were changes with the permanent secretaries in the ministry, and I don't want to make an assumption, but... You d you're not sure why it didn't materialize. That's correct, Chairman. It, let me tell you, it's an important question that I certainly, as a policymaker, would want an answer to, whether it's an issue of cost, meaning, I mean, we have heard arguments that there are cheaper imports to local production, if that is the issue. But as the member from West Westmoreland said, we have a lot of fruits that um, are grown that could um, are nutritious. You don't have to add sugar that could um, be used for the fruit juices that would support local farmers, etc. So I think it's important for us to know why the collaboration didn't work out and for us to explore it. You are spending 600 million without production. I don't know what the figure is when you start production, but it's important for that multiply effect to remain within Jamaica and not have that money go outside the country. All right, I have Member Guy, then Member Clark, then Member Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Um, no, it was... I, no, it's related to this particular one, a statement made. Um, but, Mr. Narine, you indicated that there is a lot of research and development going on. Can you indicate to the committee the level of staffing you have? Because as per... The AG's report in terms of the qualifications you have. Have you addressed those? Have you made um, adjustments in terms of the qualification of, qualifications of those persons to be engaged in the research and development? Or is that research and development not confined to your entity, but the SRC, as you have um, suggested a while ago, is involved in some amount of the assessment of the local products? Thank you for the question, Member Guy. The unit that is involved in the research and development has qualified, has a qualified competent individual that is leading the research and development. The, the person in charge of the quality assurance department is qualified, Member. Here that you, it's an associate degree in science laboratory technology, um, and you are saying that that gives the, the that, competence to do that. That's that's not the person in charge, member of the department. That is an that's an officer within the department. 
Uh -huh. So who is the person who is in charge of that area in terms of science and um, research and development? Who is qualified? It, that would be the quality assurance supervisor. And the quality assurance supervisor has what qualification? He has a master's. A master's in? Yeah, but, but, you know, it can be supplied. But I would think CEO, that's somebody who has granted a, 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 a staff, which in terms of, I'm not talking about those in the, in the plants, but somebody who is close to the, the senior management level, you would have an idea as to the, the qualification of somebody who you can readily say has a master's, it, but I don't know which master's it is, you know? Chairman, while they are waiting for that information, just a point made by Member Guy that I think we need to just re-emphasize, both for Pierce and I'm asking the Auditor General who is stepping out, Madam AG, and her department to also assist. We have come to both PAC and PAAC meetings and found issues as it relates to boards. I am just reminding and asking that even where limits are set for persons who are on boards to supply information about businesses that they have with the institutions, I think we should disregard the limits. And if you do a transaction for $1, you should have informed the board that you are connected or related to a particular company or entity. Um, Madam Pierce, it would be something to implement right away in the Ministry of Education and I think all PSEs, because what it does, it protects the government, it protects the members on the board when you disclose. So there is no confusion as to whether or not your transaction rises to the level of going to the board even if your transaction is at the level that all it requires is that it goes to a procurement committee within an organization, every single board member should take it upon themselves and every permanent secretary to say all businesses that do any business at all with the entity, even if it is $1, you must have disclosed that you have an entity that is doing business with the organization. I think that is something for us to take away from some of the issues we have had recently going forward, and we want to note it coming from this committee. Thank you, Member Horowitz. All right, Member, no, no, can I have, oh, I'm suppose I can have the answer to my question now, Chairman. A what? Thank you very um, much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Do you, do you have the answer to the question asked previously in relation to the, the qualifications? If you have it, you could probably just get that the, out of the way. The, the qualification is a Master of Science in Environment and, Environmental and Science technology. Environmental science, technology. And I know that masters and bachelor's degree are usually rounded with a, a, a tendency to one particular um, area. But environmental science and technology doesn't have anything related to foods in respect of being in charge of an area which has research and development in new products related to food. So I again ask the question, is the, the organization being guided? And further, you said that the quality assurance manager, quality assurance manager 
is the same person now who has a master's in environmental science and technology, right? But Justin. that person is heading a department or he's the one who is doing the research and development. I find it a little odd that it's almost like you, you're putting a, a square peg into a round hole um, for that individual to be the person responsible. Can you rationalize and give me an answer as to why um, that is so? I want to add to that. And while you're answering that question, I think it will be more beneficial if you give us a more comprehensive view of the number of persons who are in this research and production department for your, your, um, for your new production line. Because I think just telling us one specific person may somewhat skew our thinking into believing that it's one person running this department. So just give us an overview of that department. All right, thank you, Member, for the question. But to answer Member Guy's question, his, the focus of the Masters was chemistry, food chemistry. Okay. Sign the mic. Food chemistry. Food chemistry. Okay, that's the focus of the masters. That's, that's All right, correct. fine. Okay, so he's 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 um he's um eminently qualified then. That's okay, correct. Fine. Um, and to answer the other question that my colleague asked, how big is that team? It's three persons in the in the department at this time. Okay. So he's. He has two support staff. So he has one who is a quality assurance officer who has an a, a associate degree in food technology, as is indicated in the prompt. And the other one has what qualification? A certificate in pastry making. Wow. And a diploma in supervisory management. She has 15 years experience in quality control. She who? The one with the that's, certificate in pastry making? That's correct. Okay. Quality control. Follow up now, Chair. Um, and in terms of, because I'm interested in, in more the production side, so most of my questions will be skewed towards that. In, in these new products that you're looking to roll out, um, how soon can we expect a new line of products coming from MPL? And this is in furtherance as well in what the peers said in terms of privatization because if you have a broader range of offerings, you may find that MPL becomes more attractive, similar to what the member said, um, for divestment because persons will, or investors or business interests will be of the view that they have a wide range of products, which means they are diversified and uh, it will be more attractive for for investors and investment. So do you have a time period for these products to be rolled out? Thank you for the question, member. NPL is, we're trying to meet the deadline for the resumption of operations, which is April. Yes, that's correct. I won't tie the entity to that deadline, but that is what we're, that, that is where we're trying to go. All right. You're saying by April we'll see a new line of products coming on, or you'll just see resumption of the original product line that you had? In April there will be the reformulated products will be on stream in April. Right. So in terms of the new products, we are aiming for April deadline, but there may also be other factors um, that, that may delay that. All right. Uh, all right. Thank you for that. Um, the other question pertains specifically to, to my constituency, um, where we have faced a lot of hardships because of COVID. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so I was saying specifically in terms of the resumption in April, um, will MPL, because I know you guys have reduced dramatically, in fact, probably about 95% of your production, um, will you be looking at 
supporting schools because we have seen where schools are gradually reopening, but overall there is a level of hardship facing a lot of um, persons. Um, will MPL be looking at supporting schools expanding even for a short period in the interim um, of their offerings to some of the schools across um, Jamaica, specifically in western parishes? Because I, I do know to close the Westmoreland office. So probably, P.S., you can, can respond. Yes, let me just ask Dr. Troop, who monitors the demand on the ground and uh, should be able to tell the you a little. The demand is great. You know, I used to be one of those nutri nutrition bun eaters, you know, and I used to love the milk. Sorry, you guys cut it out. But um, with that being said, I am 100% sure that demand is, has pretty much gone through the roof because of the unusual climate that COVID has created with, right. with, um, with our parents. Because right. as an MP, I do get the visits at my office right. when I'm there on Thursdays. Right. So she should be able to tell you briefly what we've, the contingency that we've put in place to deal with the question that you've raised. Okay, good morning, Chairman. Good morning, members. Just to add that the approach that we're using now is that we have provided the grants to directly to our schools for the provision of a cooked meal for our students daily to determine if we could expand further what NPL offers. We will have to review that internally because we would have to do an assessment of what the gaps are in the school environment because there are factors that impact the supply and the interest of the students locally. So normally to take decisions, we do our internal assessment for schools that would be interested in other supplies. And we had started this discussion some time ago based on the question that the chairman asked about local content, you know, to look at local um, farmers, suppliers around our school environment, what they could provide. So we started those discussions already to see if we could organize the supply of those material in a strategic way for our school so we can increase the use of local content. So there's an, um, a, a series of conversations taking place to see how best we can support our schools. But at this point in time, we have not yet taken any decision. We are now just providing the grants to them and they do their orders and the production of the meals and distribution at this time. So, uh, sorry, just a follow-up. Do you have a timeline for the completion of of this assessment that you guys are doing. And the reason for asking, Westmoreland in particular um, has been featured, and my colleague MP is here, has been featured um, because of the, the increase in, in violence and crime. And we find that it's affecting and developing a subculture within the space. Um, and in particular, we have some schools that are now coming on online, back to face to face. So I know it has to be a balancing act, but I still would want to know if there is a timeline um, specifically for even the Western parishes, if you don't have it for the country, if you, if you can um, just give us some indication of when you think that will be completed. Okay, thank you so much for that question. So this is an ongoing exercise, but as our PS indicated, we have had some transitions, and so that has delayed we have had some transitions in our ministry. Okay, so we have had some transitions in our ministry and that has um, delayed some of the decisions that we can take. But normally for our schools, decisions are taken for full implementation at the start of the academic year. So we would have the summer to review the data, to have our consultations with our principals, and that will inform our final decision, which takes effect normally at the start of the academic year, which is September. CEO, um, just a, a quick comment, Chairman, if you, just on that same point. You know, I always, when I list to somebody saying we would have, suggest that they don't know if it was actually done. I want you to tell this committee that it was done and not that it would have been done. Because we, when we hear would have, should have, could have, basically tells me that there is no guarantee that it was actually done. It was supposed to have been part of the process. 
if you can tell this committee categorically that it was done, then say it was done instead of it would have been done. That's what we want to hear. Because when we hear would have no, it, it, it tells us in our mind there's doubt there that it was actually done. So can you categorically state if it was done or it was not done during the summer? Okay, thank you, member. So that statement would have is deliberate because, as I indicated, we have had disruptions. Some activities are not complete. The summer is the upcoming summer. The decision is likely to be taken for the start of the academic year 2022-2023. So we are not yet at the summer, but I was explaining the process. So we, the team, has been asked to look at how we can maximize on the farmers around our schools, the local suppliers and providers. That process started, but we were not able to complete because of the transitions that we have been undergoing. New directives are given, things are delayed. So we have not yet completed the process, but we have this term and the second term within which to complete to report to our permanent secretary for a decision to be taken. So you're saying you will do that in this term and next term? And in the we summer have two coming. terms, yes. Okay, I see. Thank you. Um, Chairman, am I? No, I have some members who have been waiting patiently. Member Williams, Member Clark, and Member Wright have been waiting patiently. This is you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question has been answered during the um, further proceedings, so I will forward. Member Clark? So to myself, Mr. Chairman, that the deliberation by my colleague would have asked a question and we have gotten an answer. But the concern that I have, Mr. Chairman, which I think we have not addressed or seem to be overlooking is the fact that NPL was put in place to assist or to support children in, in, in a school that are less fortunate. And so we have a large amount of students who are on path. And with this pandemic, Mr. Chairman, parents losing jobs, we would have seen an increase in the numbers. So whilst, whilst NPL, which is, which is mandated to do a certain task, Mr. Chairman, is out there not producing the way it should, I am saying that it is high time that speedily, PS, that we, and Mr. CEO, that we look at the fact that you're needed, and you're needed especially in the rural areas. Trust me, we, are, we as Member of Parliament are the ones that are getting the leaks left, right, and center as it relates to providing lunch money on many, many a days for many a student who want to go to school but are unable to go to school just because they can't find that lunch money. And remember, no, we're still not even doing a full school week. Yes. Yeah, Thank you, you George, Clark. you want go ahead, yeah. member right, you yeah. and then member okay. no. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, to the PS, um, if I should understand, um, going back to the nutrition um, in, in school, you mentioned that it will be starting with cook product. Is that so? Cooked. I'm not hearing you clearly. Cooked meals. Member, right? Cooked meal. Okay. Um, is that so? The meals are now being cooked at school. Okay, so if that the starting point, um, suggesting that um, you look in the line where you get in touch with Rara so that, especially there in Westmoreland where we have a number of farmers, so you could get some grown product from them. So the, in collaboration with Rada. So Rada could get in touch with the farmers so you could get some grown product. So the farmers can benefit in that sense. Okay, so uh, Mr. Narayan, do you want to 
just explain the, what's Bef being explored. Before Mr. Naran answers, let me just add to that, because we don't have a very good appreciation as to how NPL would incorporate local produce. Like in East Rural St. Andrew, we would have persons who are in juicing, right? Um, sometimes enterprise team set up by the community, rather would actually oversee the activities of all the individuals who have done small businesses. They're making juices and, you know, freezing and having puree and the works. Would it be possible that you can figure out a way between now and summer that you help to establish a structure as to how you would engage rather for us as members of parliament along with the extension service for rather they know all the farmers they know where the things are produced mango is definitely something that is wasted in my constituency like it is on the ground until you don't know what to do with it and so we could formulate a mechanism because we know it has to be clean and it has to meet certain um, health standards to get practically to the solution of being able to use some of our local produce close at hand. I'm still a bit confused as to how you structure, how you get to certain schools. So like in my constituency, which is rural and hilly, Westphalia School is far away from where anybody would go. I suspect the canteen helps. But equally, if there's an enterprise team in West rural area, they could be the ones providing the juices for cheap once it is sanitized and, 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 and healthy and passed, along with RADA. So permanent secretary, I'm not so sure how you would approach it if yourself along with the, the Ministry of Agriculture and the team from RADA in the various parishes could sit down and figure out which parish are close enough, logistically it makes sense for you to work with those farmers and based on the type of items that are grown in that particular location, what makes sense for us to incorporate in the feeding program. And I'm on my phone, so one recommendation came from a health practitioner that instead of the spice bun, you could be looking at kalaloo and other things like that inside of the, the bread, instead of the sugary spice bun as an option for lunch. So um, thank you, Member Holness. I'm going to allow Mr. Narayan to talk about current efforts, but the enterprise team that is now in place, no doubt they will develop a model based on the inputs that we give them, based on what we understand about the needs on the ground in our schools. As, as earlier stated, member, NPL, when activities were scaled back and the St. Mary and the Westmoreland plants were inactive, there was a proposal that we had put forward to the Ministry of Education that inclu included the use of local produce. So what we would do, we would purchase these items, prepare them, and distribute them to the schools for inclusion in their cook lunch programs. So that was a proposal that was put forward. The talks were actively being engaged with the Ministry of Agriculture but it ceased. Right. So we can, we can actively revise that proposal. All right, before Member Williams, I want to come back to a question that was asked before, but we didn't get an answer. You had indicated that your cost, while being dormant, is approximately 600 million. What I want to know is, what is your cost when you become, what is your projected cost? when you become operational and start to produce again? Because I want to understand the differential and what um, taxpayers are carrying now in this period. Thank you for the question, Chairman. The differential in cost will be dependent on the number of beneficiaries that we would supply. So for example, the budget that was put forward um, for the next financial year, we did it predicated on the assumption to feed 100,000 beneficiaries 
on the breakfast program and had approximately 19,000 beneficiaries on the snack program. And that was approximately $1.8 billion, Chairman. So, so basically the differential is about $1.2 billion then. Because you say right now you're carrying $600 million a year without activity and based on your projection you would go to $1.8 billion based on your budget. That's correct. Yeah, that's what you're saying. That's correct, Chairman. And you're saying that that's predicated on what? 100,000 students for breakfast, that's, for for breakfast. breakfast solutions and 19,000 19,000 for lunch? That's correct. Okay. Chairman, um, conjoined to your question, it would be good if NPL... On a, po on a point of order, Mr. Chairman, oh. I just want to make sure that we're paying attention to the time at hand because we want to... You we're, are. Basically, we're basically finished. Just one thing. We finish. Um, what I would love, Chairman, um, and NPL team, and NPL team, raw cost sometimes does not give us a good indication of our level of efficiency. 600,000, if we're not functioning our 600 million versus 1.2 billion, it, it doesn't really sit with us. What would be good? is to work out what is your break-even point of operation so that you are able to provide guidance to say, look, if the government funds feeding for X number of students, we are operating at break-even. And that is having incorporated all your cost analysis and efficiency in operation. So an efficient operation, feeding X number of children, we break even. Anything over that, it means that we are, I well, we don't necessarily need to be profitable as a government, but anything over that, we are actually now making savings from economies of scale. I would love to see MPL doing something like that and providing it to the ministry so that we have a better guide as to what makes sense. Because the decision could be taken to say, look, instead of having 100,000 children on path, if we had 150,000 children, it is not costing us anymore. And therefore, strategically, we can now feed 50,000 more children at the same cost. So I, I would love to see us doing that type of analysis so that we can provide a more efficient service to our children. Chairman, I have a few questions. Go ahead, Member Guy. Um, Chairman, I want to go back to the actual AG's report outside of the prompts. Um, page 11 of the AG's report, we found 70 instances where service providers' invoices total 13.7 million predated the requisition purchase order, indicating that the work was executed prior to the authorization. We know that the procurement manager's involvement in the process was limited to signing the purchase order, which were prepared after the services were already provided. Um, what is management's response to this um, um, finding by the AG, and what is the way forward in respect of that? Secondly, um, we note here when you go on to five of the, the same um, summary, um, the, the full report, and that's, I'm on page um, 12 now. The, the, um, the human resource manager who only possessed six subjects at the GC level when the position required a Bachelor of Science degree. And I, I want to say that um, well, I want to find out whether this was a case where um, it says in August 2017, NPL employed a human resource manager. So it's not a case where they're upgraded from one position to the other, who possess only six subjects at the GC level, whereas the position required a Bachelor of Science degree. What was the remuneration for this particular individual, having regard to the fact that um, the qualifications were much less? than what were 
what was demanded for that salaried position. Um, the, the other question, Chairman, um, the matter of the, the board allowed the same individual to perform the role of internal auditor and financial control at various intervals, a practice which compromised the effectiveness of NPL's internal control mechanism. Has this been resolved? Those are the three so far, Chairman. Thank you for the question, member. The, as it relates to the internal auditor, that has been resolved. The members, the employee has been returned to his substantive post. Um, we have advertised for a financial controller, and we are actually shortlisting the applicants for that position. Mm -hmm. may, may I just ask a question with regards to that? Uh, um, with regards to the internal auditor, was the, this person the only person in the internal audit department, or was the, and was this person the head of the internal audit? Thank you for the question, member. At, at the time, the employee was the only person in the internal audit unit. He was the head of the unit. The, what, what transpired was that um, our financial controller left at the time. We were undergoing our financial statement audit. So the decision was taken to transfer the, the, the member because he's qualified um, ACC and to, to assist with, with completion of the audit. During that period, a junior auditor was recruited to fill the, the, the position in the department well, because so there was an additional, we were actively, before the, um, the, the employee was transferred, the auditor was transferred, if, we were if, recruiting if, if, for his, fully, his junior at the time. CEO, because these things happened in many organizations, private and public, where there's an audit going on and the financial controller would have resigned or separated for some reason they usually pull from the internal audit unit. Thanks for the explanation. To, um, to follow up on member guy question though with regards to the procurement, I don't know if I'm following. I'll allow you to answer that because I want to comment on the, the, the question with regards to the procurement finding. So answer and I'll comment here with your permission. Thank you, member. As, as it relates to the, the procurement, we have accepted, NPL has accepted the findings of the AG report. Um, we have made changes to the approach regarding the maintenance, but off note, what exists during that period was that there are service providers at NPL that undertake these services. Now, the factory, when we are in full operation, we operate on a 24-hour basis, right? Now, machine equipment will break down during that period. There is no administrative personnel in office at that time. We would need to undertake repairs to ensure that we meet our deliverables of providing meals to children. The procurement department would have a list of these contractors on file and on call. The maintenance team or managers, they would engage these persons to undertake um, repairs. But negating that, there are instances where uh, as stated by the report, that we were in compliant and we have accepted those. We have advertised 
uh, in the publication, we have engaged, utilized the national competitive bidding process for the resumption of operations in April. So we have accepted the AG findings and are now compliant. Um, just as a follow-up to that, please. Sorry, Member Holness. Um, AG, would the, the establishment of framework agreements with these external um, contractors um, could be a way forward in terms of, of, of obviating the need for you to have a comment on it that these were entered into contracts without the appropriate due diligence or the, the, the paperwork? To understand the question, Member, you're speaking about the way forward yes. and the corrective measure um, to be taken. Well, certainly whatever steps are taken by NPL, um, we will do a follow-up audit. And in, um, if framework agreements with these respective persons could be in place by NPM, put in place. Right. No, no, I'm asking if that is permissible. That's all. I mean, I, I, I'm not aware. I don't so want I'm to hazard a guess on own. that. I would have okay. to really make reference to the procurement guidelines because whatever is to be done must be done within the realms of the government. I remember wholeness. I still keep getting notes from outside of the meeting as it relates to nutrition, so you realize this is very important. So one nutritionist indicated that protein bars which are being researched currently are also high in sugar. So I am recommending as one of the options in the whole discussion with the nutritionist and working out coming from even member guys comment that one third not being mostly sugar in caloric intake is that we ask also the Ministry of Health if they can assist us in formulating what is going to be a cost effective feeding program or new products program that also meet our Ministry of Health and Wellness which is a different slant on, on health um, Ministry of Health and Wellness requirements for, for nutrition. So it would be good to, to include um, MOHW so that we are all moving in the policy direction of being a healthier society with, with everything we consume. Chairman, there's a question thanks. that I asked which has remained unanswered. Thanks, thanks for the recommendation. And the Member, question is... But, no, man, I thought you were just... But I have actually written to the Ministry of Health on December 23, engaging their assistance um, with, with our nutrition. I remember, guys, say as an outstanding that I question. asked was about no, the, the human resource manager and the qualification and the salary. Um, was the salary that was paid um, commensurate with the qualification or the salary that was paid was for the person that they bachelor's um, purported qualification. No, 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 no. The report said, and the person stayed for three years in that position. So I want to know if the salary that was paid was paid at the level of the qualification or the level of the, the establishment on the book for a bachelor's? Thanks for the question, member. The salary that was paid to the individual was commensurate with the, the scale, the salary scale. Could you be more direct and indicate so if, if somebody not sufficiently qualified is paid at the lowest level of the scale, and for three years, that's not very temporary. Mm -hmm. was it the lowest? So he was paid at the lowest level at the scale. No, but it's my understanding of the scale, though, you know, um, Mr. Narayan, is that the lowest level of the scale immediately assumes that you have the qualification for the position. That's my understanding. And you, please, if you could disabuse me of that feeling right now, right? Because if the requirement for that position is 
a bachelor's degree, then my thinking, and unless I am uh, reasonably um, dissuaded from that, is that it is the lowest level of the scale for a person who has that particular minimum requirement for the post. No, but Chair, um, I'm very much aware, and maybe the auditors can say otherwise, but I'm very much aware when someone is put in a position in government, they are put at the first point of the scale, and they are what you call QB, qualification bar. So unlike other persons, they can't move up, they can't move to the second until they are, they are qualified. That's what no. I am aware of. I'm not aware that if you're not, if you're, if you're appointed in a position, chair, if you're appointed as a HR director, you are supposed to be paid as, as the HR director. But in terms of where you are placed in the scale, it is usually at the first, at the lowest, lowest point, the first point. And persons are not moved at all, or ought not to be moved until they are satisfied. And even there's a policy that gives a certain amount of time for person to obtain qualification, you know. So I'm not aware of person being paid. All right, let me, the AG otherwise. wants to intervene, and then I'd ask the PS or somebody from the ministry to answer. AG. Okay, so uh, Mr. Sibley is speaking to a policy that existed some time ago, the qualification bar. And it was some time ago when um, civil servants did not have the requisite qualification and they were being encouraged to qualify themselves. So you are correct that there was a time when you had a qualification bar and you would not pass that bar unless you obtain the qualification. So the real issue with this matter here is that the individual was appointed. So in government, you can act in a position without having the requisite qualification and be given time to be appointed in the position. So there are two different things, but this individual was actually appointed without the requisite qualification, and that is where the breach occurs. Um, um, Madam AD, um, I'm in oneness with you, as, as you, you, you say that. Appointing, I'm not familiar uh, I know it, one ought not to be appointed in the position. It's an holding point, and the, if you do not obtain your qualification by a certain point, you're either you're supposed to revert to where, where if you, you are promoted internally, reverted to the position, or um, you, you, you are asked to resign. So I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you at all with the, with the point, the audit point. What I was talking to so is Chairman really point of order, the sir. appointment. The, it's really the, that there's no such Mr. thing Chairman. as someone is paid for the qualification. Mr. Chairman, on a point of order, sir. Yes, Member Clark. We are now at 1 o'clock, and Time. We, we know what needs yeah, to be done within that hour before 2 o'clock. I know. We are wrapping, and we're wrapping, so Member Clark, I will assure you that we Mr. will be completely... Mr. Chairman, so often we have been being over the box for not starting on time parliament. No, man. We, we, we have had a good start this year, and we're not going to make let us, this let us continue. Let us continue in that vein, sir. All right. Let, let, me, let me just... I, I am conscious of the time. I just have one final question and then a summary, because, well, there are, there are two members who are still outstanding. The, is there an issue with your pension plan at this point in time? And is it causing persons who have entitlements not to receive it.
picture man the new board has actively resolved any matters outstanding related to the pension plan. So there is no challenges with the pension plan, Chairman. Okay. All right, thank you. Just to, so, me, Member Wilson, you have a burning one. Go ahead, and then I take it as the last one. It, it's not burning per se, but I wanted to dive out the conversation, and I'm conscious of what Member Clark just said. Um, I wanted to find out, was there, because of the, the active um, flux, state of flux that MPL was operating in, was there at any point any freeze on hiring of new staff? Was there any directives? Um, in terms of the, because I understand when you're going through a, a privatization model, how difficult it would be because you're, you're basically tied, your hands are tied behind your back with the expectations that you will deliver quality service and value for money um, until you come out the other end. And generally, it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. All right, thank you for the question, member. But yes, there was a freeze on hiring at the entity in 2018. Um, how, did, how did that play into your decision making? Um, um, it, it severely impacted the operations at the entity. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman. I, will, I will defer to you, Chairman, in the interest of Member Clarks. I think today was a very good session. And I am looking forward to the information requested coming back to the committee because we would really love to see MPL operating in a way that we know serves the interests of our country and children. Well, just to, to, to wrap, just a remind you of what we are expecting. One is the timeline for the divestment and from the engagement with DBJ to when you expect to be at the end of the process. Secondly, a breakdown of the methodology, the procurement methodology for the 143 million. And I think those were the two outstanding matters that we wanted. Members, any, we have just date for next meeting and then we are, yes, Member Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The standing order for the House of Representatives speaks to certain dress code in 84A, section one. So, and, and, I, I just want to, Mr. Narayan and the, the team, you are required in Parliament to come with a necktie. It can be like mine or it can be like Member Clark's. Um, we have some members, if a particular member was on the committee, he would probably object to you being si sitting in here, but he's not on this committee. So, for future reference, just please ensure you have a tie when you come into um, the chambers. Members, for the Chairman. next meet. The respective permanent secretaries to advise their team of the dress code of the parliament when they are coming. Members, we have, in looking at the dates for the next meeting, we had agreed next week is out because there is rehearsal for the ceremonial opening of parliament. The members had said to me that the, was it the 15th was a difficulty? Last week you had, oh, is it 22nd? So we will meet on the 15th and then we will look at a new date for the 22nd. So our next meeting is the 15th, which is two weeks from today. Sorry, and the 15th would be just would be the joint committee for tertiary education on the 15th. And then we will come back for a new date for the original meeting schedule for the 22nd, which is suitable to all the members. Motion for adjournment, member wholeness, member Wilson. Thank you very much, members. Thank you. Hmm. All right. Look up all the little pieces of things that came to you. I have to do reflection. Yes. Huh?